Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome for the second panel discussion of the week. We are streaming live from Geneva, from the Watches and Wonders Salon, and we're very happy to welcome you here today. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about distribution and how distribution has been impacted by the pandemic. What will remain? What has changed? We will try to answer to these questions in a few seconds with my guests, so let's go and meet them. My first guest today is here with me on the set. This is Renaud Littré, International Commercial Director Cartier, who is former CEO of China for the French brand symbolized by the famous Panther and worldwide famous for its expertise and as pioneer of watchmaking at the beginning of the 20th century. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're very happy to have you with us on the set. Delighted to be with you. <laughs> okay, shared, shared pleasure. Uh, next to me on the other side is Professor Stéphane Giraud, Professor of Strategy and Organizational Innovation at IMG Lausanne. You help luxury brands innovate and transform in response to disruption, and you helped prepare this panel today. Good thank afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. A pleasure to uh, be with you all, and thank you very much to all the watchers today that have joined us. Exactly, live. exactly. We have some more guests. They are today connected with us. The next one is Philippe Tardivel, Marketing Director Hublot. You entered Hublot in 2013, coming from the Formula One world, and Hublot is an innovative and a trendsetter brand. We're happy to have you with us today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and good morning for those that are connecting uh, from the rest of the world because uh, I, it's very early morning, I think, for Ben in the States. So, uh, exactly. hello to everybody. That's true, and we're glad that we're all together. Next uh, guest today is uh, Edouard Melon, CEO H Mother. He took over the watch brand from Shafus in 2012 and did what he likes the most building a brand creating with H Mother, the high brand of watchmaking tradition. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and uh, pleasure to be here from Schaffhausen. Thank you, thank you very much. And our last guest is a band climber, founder of Hodinkee, a luxury watch and lifestyle website based in the United States. Thank you for being with us so, so early, Ben. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I, I wouldn't, I would definitely not rather be in bed right now. Okay, that's great to know. You're calling from New York, right? Yes, New York, New York. Okay, perfect. So uh, we have all the guests. We are almost ready for this panel discussion. But first, before starting, I would like to let you know that you can send in your comments, you can send in your questions, and we will be happy to answer to all of them, or at least most of them. At the end of this session, you have a Q&A button in your screen, so you just press on it and you send your questions and comments. And who will deal with all these questions? Well, not us, because we will be busy talking. This is Sébastien um, uh, Benjamin. Benjamin, excuse me, Benjamin Tesser and Pascal Rapsu, who are just over there. And uh, well, I hope you're ready to get all these questions because Definitely it should are. be a lot. Absolutely ready. Okay, that's perfect. Awesome. We're all set. So um, I would like to start right away, um, maybe with you, uh, Stefan, because um, this is your main topic. This is what you're working on. You know, actually, what we're dealing with today. Um, the pandemic has hit it really bad on the whole industry, not only watchmaking, but everywhere. So can we have a little mapping of what um, has been going on lately? Yeah, so I think uh, it was an unprecedented year. You know, um, no one expected uh, such a catastrophe on a global scale, right? So the, uh, the figures about the evolution of sales and revenues for the whole industry and the luxury sectors in general speak by themselves, you know, um, minus 20, 25% uh, across Which is the huge. board. However, uh, the first remark I would like to make is that it's been really, really uneven. Um, some brands um, and very large, strong brands, but also amongst independents, have done very, very well during this crisis. The second remark is that we're probably going to see uh, consolidation happening mm -hmm. as the result of uh, uh, what's happening. But the third remark is that, and as I was preparing with you all the panel, um, I was so inspired by the amount of innovation, the agility 
that's coming out from the brands, from the retailers. Um, and I think everyone has had to improvise without any cookbook, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to get the flavor about what these brands are doing. And by the way, um, these examples are really framing a topic which is really close to my heart. I'm publishing a book in a couple of months, Resetting Management, about agility transformation. You know, what do you do when the environment is so uncertain? So I would like to thank everyone for responding present this morning and talking about examples of agility in the distribution sector. And that's what we're going to do right now with you, uh, Renaud Littré, uh, talking about Cartier, of course. Um, we're talking about wholesale, but also own retail. How has it been impacted at Cartier and what are the lessons you learned? Well, it's been, a, it's been definitely a very, uh, a very challenging year, uh, but also a very transformative year because a lot, as, uh, uh, as Stefan said, we had to face really an unprecedented uh, situations. We've, uh, uh, at one point, uh, we had uh, close to 90% of our distribution closed worldwide, That's huge. Uh, which uh, I think none of us could, uh, could ever imagine or could ever forecast for, for such, a, such a situations. Uh, but one of the, uh, the, very, uh, uh, the very striking uh, learning process from, from this, uh, this crisis is that we've, uh, we've all learned, as you said, to be quite agile and to react very quickly and very effectively. And one of the most important aspects of it was to maintain and create new ways of engaging with clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And digital has played a crucial role in that, mm -hmm. but also the ways we've been able to converge and make all our channels work together. And this is really one of the key learning and one of the key takeaway from the crisis. Basically, the, the, bo the boundaries between online and offline, but also between uh, the various point of sales with these for us, our boutiques or our watch partners, those boundaries have sort of uh, faded away right. and we've now have a much more co cohesive and a much more coherent approach in terms of client experience across all those channels and this is something that we've been wanted to do for many years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the crisis has forced us but in a way also made made it possible for that to happen much much faster acceleration that's yes. really what happened so let's see if it's the same for um the other uh, guests today uh, let's move to uh, edouard melon with h Monda. do you have uh, the same feeling did you live the same things how did it go well it went actually pretty well because i think as a as an independent and rather uh, dynamic young brand um We've been facing crisis for, for many years, but we were agile and reactive. We managed to, uh, to react very quickly, actually putting into place many different tools, concierge service to, uh, to support all our partners around the world. As you said, and pretty much 90% a year ago, we had 90% 90, 90 of our stores closed. But when you sell, you know, not millions of watches, you can still deal with every single one of them one-to-one -one with all those media. Today, I feel like I, I know my clients and my partners way better than before. We used to travel maybe once a year to the markets. Now we interact on a daily basis mm -hmm. through so many different channels that I feel like many be became friends, whereas they were like people we knew and we were doing business with. Well, that's really impressive to see how the connections have been made and the main word would be agility. We have understood that. Um, do you have the same uh, feeling, Philippe Tardivel at Hublot? So I think uh, what we've learned is basically what has happened is has shortened the distance between the end consumer and the brand. I mean, traditionally, uh, because we operate both with a network of our boutique and a wholesaler network, um, I mean, what has happened is that effectively we had to develop tools to be able to dialogue directly with the end consumer. And the fact that we've shortened that distance had uh, an impact on also on the way we operate, you know, the, the business, but also on the knowledge of who the end consumer is. And uh, we, we gathered a wealth of, uh, you know, on information on the behavior and who these people are, their habits, uh, and uh, and somehow. Uh, Yet it's, it's true that you know uh, it's a digital transformation, so it is based on digital tools. But the human is at the center of all that has happened, and that is very int interesting to see that ret retrospectively, all the digital tools are helping us to actually connect the, the people together. So this human sense is there, not physically. Uh, uh, so yes, the big lesson is, is really, uh, let's say, this shortening of the end consumer. 
uh, with dialoguing with the brand and developing specific tool for us, right? You below, you know, we've uh, developed the yeah, digital boutique. We will talk about that later. But uh, but yes, the, the, the learning also in the way we worked with our uh, end uh, consumer in the wholesale was quite complicated uh, because we had to help our um, distributors and um, and retailers because for them it was even more difficult. Uh, but all of overall, it's uh, you know a very inspiring. Inspiring, I would say, uh, experience, and certainly one that uh, has brought more, more agility, like uh, the other uh, colleagues have stated. Yeah, for sure, it creates uh, opportunities, and it's challenging, but it brings something new. Uh, maybe we can have your point of view, uh, Ben Clymer at Hodinkee. Um, how do you see it um, when when we look take a look at all retail distribution channels? Sure. I mean, you know, the, the business that, that, that we run is, is very different than my, my esteemed colleagues here. You know, we, we are a digitally native business. We, we in fact, don't have any retail at all. We, we, we will and had one planned uh, pre-COVID. But for, for us, you know, the, the, the transition from pre-pandemic to in the middle of the pandemic to soon to be post-pandemic is, is really just an acceleration of things we already had planned and, and really an acceleration of, of the inevitable, if I can say. Uh, which is, you know, a focus for us on on certainly commerce, and that that's how we pay the bills, just like everyone else. But it really comes down to content and and community. And with Hodinki, we had built five years ago our own community platform that sees around three hundred thousand people every month. This is just active commenters on our site, uh, and then our our platform see around three million people every month. And so we have that engagement just increasing wildly over the pandemic because the people that were you know traveling to geneva to the trade shows or traveling to basel or going to art basel in miami or going to the you know the the shows that we all kind of go to are no longer going anywhere and in fact they're sitting on their phones or they're sitting in front of their computers and they're just browsing the internet for content about the things that they love and that is exactly what we do and and more than that we, we provide a community for people to to respond and kind of add their own thoughts on products and then inevitably, you know, purchase them if, if, if they're so inclined. So distribution for, for us is, has, hasn't has changed at all, really. It's just kind of sped up. Um, but, you know, what we've seen with with brands such as those represented by my, my friends here on this call is is exactly as, as described. I mean, it is a shortening of the chain between brands and the consumer, which I think, again, what had to be inevitable. Um, you know, the, the wholesale network, if I, if I can say something that I don't think is really controversial at all, but I think kind of accepted. Well, in not, not with these brands in particular, but there were so many weak retailers, at least in the United States. I can speak to the US much, much more concisely than the rest of the world. There were so many very, very weak retailers that were really, you know, hanging on by a thread that really didn't have a connection to their consumer at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those may or may not have made it through the pandemic. And, you know, I, I we we helped in every way we could. We actually promoted several of these these retailers just to kind of give them a lifeline during the the early days of the pandemic. But I think we're just seeing a tightening of the market. Um, you know, we're seeing people uh, reacting in a way that is um, much more direct than ever before. And I think that will only help people kind of feel a closer connection to these brands because the the weakest link in any chain, as we all know, is uh, or, you know any any chain uh, has one weakest link and that can break the entire chain. And that could be one retailer or that could be one salesperson at one retailer. And so I think the the consolidation of distribution, I think, will only make brands stronger because we're losing those kind of weaker links as, as we go along. Yeah, we definitely understand that the connection with your public, with the customers is the key. And um, of course, we hear about uh, various brands and various sizes of brands. How is it when you are dealing with Cartier, which is a big brand, how is it that you get in touch really with your consumers and create this link, direct link? The link is, as my colleague said, is a human link. And uh, every, every single point of sales uh, creates these human connections and the connectivity with our clients. Whether it's a uh, brick and mortar point of sales with, the, uh, uh, with our, our sales associates or the sales associates of our retailers or our uh, e-commerce channels or even our call centers where we have our ambassadors. So this link, these connections that we create, these human connections that we create, uh, and, and as we said earlier, these more direct connections and these more 
uh, this better understanding uh, of, uh, of the relations and the engagement with, uh, with our clients is created across all these points of sales. Mm -hmm. So that's why th this touch point, and this is why it's very important that they are all connected because our clients are moving from one to another and they, do, they expect to have the same seamless experience from one to another. I, I see you taking so many notes, Stefan. Uh, what, what, what strikes you when you hear all that for the moment? Yeah, so I, I think it's very interesting that um, the human touch is absolutely fundamental. It's a, the DNA of luxury. But I think what's going to really make the difference, and, and here I'm thinking about you distributors particularly, um, is, is your data capability. Mm -hmm. Right, and and I think one of the big shifts that I, I see for agile distribution is uh, the ability to um, actually shift from a transactional model to one which is more personalized and intimate, based on understanding the customer context. Right, and everything will be based and starting from where is your CRM. Think about retailers have been trained, you know, everything we want to sell. The customer has pushed our doors, we're going to sell. But think about what you could do with the four out of five people who haven't bought in your boutique now. And it all starts from engaging with them, getting their data, and afterwards you get them in, their, in the customer journey outside the store, okay? Really? And this is the data capability that, and, and how you use that. And, and create the personalized experience. I think the, uh, that, the, yeah. the, uh, the, the purpose of connecting, uh, connecting all our touch points and uh, getting to know our clients better and talking and engaging with them is at the end of the day is really to create this personalized experience because the mm. message that we have to have and the connections that we have to have with our clients has to be based on the individual clients exactly. and the knowledge of us, of them. Right. Uh, so personalization, have. this yes. is also one of the main key. Um, I saw you, maybe, was it right or not, but I saw you nodding uh, Philippe Tardivel at Hublot. Uh, do you want to answer to that? Do you want to answer to that? Yeah, I think this one-to-one -one relationship is effectively uh, one that needs to be shared. So we started uh, here, uh, as I said, developing a digital boutique, which is a, a kind of in-between situation between e-commerce, which is purely transactional, and a personal relationship uh, engaging with clients. And we see that for luxury brands, it could be you know, a way of still having this human touch, but yet using and the potential of, uh, of the tools. And I think uh, Ben hinted to this, but the contents are also very important. What we've learned from this is basically, you need you know, the good relationship, you have to have incredible products, that's you know, what makes a difference, but also to support all of that, uh, you need you know, great contents that is shareable, that people will enjoy, that gets noticed, and, uh, and therefore uh, the energy and uh, the resources that you need to, be, to put behind this is important, and yet for the distribution that is new because they are not used to use this type of content. So even if you produce it, you have to help them uh, be structured. They don't even have the human resources internally. You know, when you talk to uh, some retailers, and it's normal, it's uh, more, most of the time family business uh, and, 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 and they do not have their use to sell products, but not necessarily packaging them or showcasing them in, the, in, in, you know, in, in a digital environment. And that's where there's a lot of uh, you know, pedagogy and helping them through this training uh, of, uh, of using all the tools that are available to them to push forward uh, you know, uh, the, the, the product and engage with the client. And of course, uh, the data is, is uh, the basis because if it's likely like, um, I mean, Stefan was explaining, CRM is, is so important. And I think for our industry as a whole, yet we do not necessarily all have at all level uh, used so far this type of uh, central information and certainly not with the wholesale network because uh, the wholesaler and the retailers, you know, they would like to keep this at a local level because this is their client and not necessarily putting this, you know, in, in, in the greater database. So there is a work to be done there as explaining that, you know, if you have a central database, then it's much uh, 
easier to share and it benefits to everybody. And now with the e-commerce, of course, you know, e-commerce has no frontiers. There is no physical barrier. So anyway, you're going to be talking with clients uh, away from your normal catchment areas. And that is also bringing other type of, uh, you know, engagement in the relationship with, with clients away from the geographical catchment areas of your boutiques. Yeah, for sure. So that's a lot of data to deal with. But if you deal with the right way, then it becomes something that you can really use as a strength. As a strength. I would like to go back to you, um, Edouard Melon, CEO of Age Mother, um, and see how you feel about the doom and gloom um, for physical retail, because uh, we've heard a lot of that. And uh, with everything that we're sharing right now, what are the perspectives according to you? Just before I, I, I answer that, if, if I may, I just want to give the perspective sure. of independent small brands on, on the subject we just talked about, um, database, data, CRM. I think it's, a, it's really the, the, the golden years for independent watchmaking because that gives us an amazing opportunity. In the past, I mean, theory says that before uh, uh, somebody converts into buying a watch, you usually need to touch that person through different channels about seven times. In the past, that would mean, you know, having the boutiques, having, I don't know how much money invested in media, maybe to sponsoring, things that we cannot do very efficiently as independent brands. Today, thanks to CRM, managing well your data, you can touch somebody on Instagram, engage him through a message, drive him to your newsletter, meet, have him uh, go on your website. And in a matter of, of days, this person really discovers and knows your brand. That's an amazing opportunity. And that's where, as, as my colleague said, um, managing data, using CRM wi uh, wisely, creating amazing content, sometimes you know, trying to uh, bring something that make or create discussions with those people is very, very efficient. And with, at the end of the day, the possibility to drive them to e-commerce, but also to the boutiques. And uh, that's an amazing opportunity. And I think that's why we see independent brands going so fast at the moment. Now, going back to the doom and gloom, um, I see, of course, digitalization going, uh, being an, an amazing opportunity, but we shouldn't forget, of course, the, the, real, the real stores. I think now we need to look at it as an omni-channel uh, perspective. The stores is definitely the place where you get the real experience. I think people might not go and do the transactions in the stores, but it's definitely where they go and experience the, the brand, the people, it's human touch. I mean, it's, we're still selling emotion there. We're not selling products. We see uh, on our side really every single watch as a piece of art, and I think the best way to communicate that is through those stores. In the past, Moser, we were very wholesale driven, which we're moving slowly towards boutiques and even lounges. You, you don't have to be you know, on the Fifth Avenue ground floor and pay a huge amount of rent. You can be on the second, third floor as a destination where people have time, they can really discover and experience the brand. So I think there's very, very positive uh, things coming into actual retail in the near future. Uh, ben Clymer, you started the other way around, actually, because you were on e-commerce and, and not really a physical retail. So how, how do you react to that? Right. Yeah, look, I mean, we, we believe in the power of the right kind of physical uh, retail, for sure. And as I mentioned, you know, we, we had a store, we still have a store uh, being planned in Soho. It's the old uh, Supreme flagship, if you're, if you're familiar with that brand. So we were able to get their historic New York Soho space. Uh, and we believe that will be an amazing kind of headquarters for Hodinkee fans around the world to come to New York. But we have no plans and never will, frankly, have plans for a global rollout of, of, of boutiques. And I think our business is very different than, than, than most others and that, you know, we'll do $100 million in sales this year of people that have never touched any of our watches. You know, Edward mentioned that the average touch point was seven times before they, they buy the watch. Our, our, our guys don't touch them at all. And I think, you know, the, the reason we're able to do that and the reason that, that people are headed that way is because people that read our site and, and other sites like ours are so hyper knowledgeable already. They know exactly what they want before. And if they don't, they come to our site and they're then informed by our editors about which, you know, which Moser to buy, which MBNF to buy, which Cartier, et cetera. Uh, and so it is a very, very different type of, of, of business for sure. We really believe in, as I said, the, the right type of physical retail. I think my colleagues would agree that the majority of mom and pop and, and traditional retailers around the world are probably not the right type of retail, but there are great stores that, you know, that these guys have done great jobs. All the mono brand stores are usually wonderful are usually beautiful you know really special uh because they represent your brand perfectly but you know the 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 traditional kind of retail network that exists at least in the us is is really lackluster and so i think you really just want to be careful with that but i think that the model that we look at for for physical retail would be similar not to the scale of course similar to the way tesla 
does things, which okay. is, you know, they, they have showrooms. They have a showroom in East Hampton. They have a showroom in the Meatpacking District in New York. And then probably the next showroom is somewhere in the middle of New Jersey, you know, in a, in a nice town in New Jersey. And you go there, you, you try the car, you can try the Model S, whatever, and then the car is delivered to your door. And, you know, we'll never have, we'll never be Tesla. Certainly that's not the goal, but I really like that model for distribution because it allows you to have those touch points and see the thing and drive the thing in this case, but doesn't actually require the service center, the sales, you know, the, the, the amount of administration that, that goes into to running a full-time dealership. You know, if you look at the Tesla dealership in, in New York, it's a beautiful little glass showroom. And then you look at the BMW dealership in Manhattan and it's, you know, it's a castle that probably has 500 employees running around there every single day. And which one, you know, which which one is running a, a more kind of seamless, kind of efficient business? And it's certainly Tesla. So, so uh, and really so, you know, we are... actually, Ben Clymer, sorry, sure. I'm interrupting you, but I just wanted to go back yeah. then to Cartier because you have this kind of huge stores. Well, we, we, we have a significant distribution, brick and mortar distributions, but we think we have a very selective one and a well-balanced one uh, between the, the channels and the geographic. So, so we don't have a, a plan of uh, changing drastically our, our, our footprint when it comes to uh, the physical store. But to the point that was made, what, is, what we are doing right now is we're looking at how we reinventing those stores because we have to repurpose them. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, their purpose is becoming wider, larger, more diverse. Uh, it used to be purely transactional and that's our store as well as our retailer stores. Uh, they used to be purely transactional. Now they become center of experience, center of connectivities and relations, even centers of fulfillment sometimes because we are doing some e-commerce fulfillment from some, uh, some of our stores today. So the purpose of the stores are evolving and we need to rebuild and rethink them and that's what we're doing in this, uh, in this kind of uh, versatility and this kind of uh, agility again, because these are things that will change regularly and uh, there will be new purposes coming uh, regularly that we have to be able to, to, to do. And historically, we used to build our stores in a very sort of uh, fixed manner, right. and then we will renovate after five years, 10 years mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, here, things are going much faster, much more diverse. Do you have the same feeling at Hublot? Do you, do you share this vision? Uh, yes, uh, very much so. The, the reality is that, you know, at Hublot, because uh, we are a younger brand, so we don't have that many uh, boutiques. But uh, yes, you know, we have a, probably a footprint of about over 100 uh, boutiques. But certainly, they are now a destination and an experiential destination. So therefore, there needs to be something more than uh, just the actual uh, transaction of buying the watch. But we know, I think, what doesn't change is effectively people are not just buying the watch uh, on an impulsive manner. So therefore, you know, they could come in and browse around, you know, in our uh, boutiques, come and, and discover a collection, but also enter and in, in the world of, of, of the brand, you know. And uh, I, I think it's, it's entirely true that we need to be uh, more, um, you know, flexible in the type of, uh, you know, topics of or even type of merchandising that are, are inside the boutiques and the offerings because people, when they buy, you know, watch today, uh, they want, I mean, buying a luxury product is always, you know, realizing a dream, but somehow they want, you know, they're buying into an experience at the purchase, but also the evocation that goes uh, beyond the product. And these evocations, they need to feel and have some, uh, you know, insight already in an environment that is probably more open and uh, so we have the great chance of having, you know, uh, great locations uh, in the world, uh, but we are not immune from any of what's happening because other brands are away. When you look at uh, sports goods, for instance, uh, at how, you know, uh, those stores have evolved, uh, that can give us a hint as to what people are behind, uh, you know, are going for. I mean, uh, most of the time now, uh, they're going into a store just to see the products or try it, but probably go and home and buy it, you know, uh, digitally. So uh, that's why the expectation of the, the experience uh, is completely diverse. So yes, we also uh, think that uh, inside of the customer journey, there will be, you know, a, a, a pass through the boutique uh, at some stage, uh, I, I, and therefore we need to have an offering that goes beyond just the transaction in the boutique. Um, Edouard Melon, I would like to go back to you right now because you were talking before that um, you are getting closer to your customer because you're talking directly to them and you're actually doing that through Instagram, if I'm not wrong, and these are the new communication channels. 
So um, how do you see that emerging? How important will that be in the future, according to you? All right. Well, I think it's becoming more and more important. And we've seen how obvious that was in the last 12, 18 months. But I think uh, it's, you have to, it's not just Instagram. I think it's any channel. It's any uh, digital uh, social media, any platform. We consider all of them as kind of uh, e-commerce platform where places to engage and then uh, convert uh, customers. So we treat every single one of them very, very similarly. We try to create content for all of them. We have a team dedicated to, uh, to answer, to engage, to, to discuss, to, uh, in, to go faster and better. I think these are opportunities for us to give a better service, to provide the right answers quickly to the customers. Uh, again, to, uh, as I said before, we, the, the customers today engage much faster and much stronger with, with the band, brands. This is our opportunity. As Ben said, they don't touch the, the, the watch and they buy, actually buy it. That's, that's the beauty of it. I mean, the, there's the trust that is being built this relationship is so strong, this emotion means that people are, are ready to invest, in our case, you know, 50,000, 30,000, 100,000 for pieces that he never touched. And actually, they come on our e-commerce and buy it, which blew my mind last year when, when that started happening, when we implemented our e-commerce. So again, it's really this omni-channel, being consistent, having the right message, being authentic, human, keeping this, this uh, relationship and building this relationship with, with all those people. And it's not there to go. I mean, it's just the beginning of it. Yeah, I would like to have uh, Ben Clymer's point of view on, on the topic. What do you think? Will, the, will that remain after the pandemic? Yes, yes, that, that, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that the pandemic, you know, in, in terms of distribution for watches and, and for most things, really, has, as I said, just expedited the inevitable. We, we all knew this was coming. I mean, you know, We've been building business for this moment for 13 years. You know, I mean, we've been doing e-commerce for watch accessories since 2011. We've been selling authorized watches online before, you know, before Mr. Porter. You know, in 2016 and 17, uh, with with Tag Heuer and, and Vacheron and brands like that. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not saying it's right for everyone, but it it does it it makes sense for our consumer, which is certainly much more digitally savvy, tends to be younger. Digital first, you know, first class and everything in some ways. Um, so yeah, I think that this is this makes a lot of sense for for most brands. Certainly makes sense for for our our little brand. Um, and I think, look, I you know what I what I mentioned about Tesla, I think probably wouldn't make sense for for my friend here at Cartier. I mean, the Cartier Mansion on Fifth Avenue is one of the most special experiences in retail. Period. And even the the stores on the west side that that aren't flagships are, are really very special, but. I think mono brand stores that represent brands so perfectly like the Cartier Mansion are few and far between. And I think for our business, which again, we don't have a flagship and we've grown to this level without any physical retail, I think is, is a really different conversation. And I think it's a, we really believe in real e-commerce. And what I mean by that is people making purchasing decisions without any human interaction. You know, and so there are other folks in the online watch space that have kind of digital storefronts but actually the transaction takes place over the telephone or over email or chat, and that's great, but that's not e-commerce. That's really not. That's just a digital storefront, and then the transaction is handled the old-fashioned way. Our, our hypothesis and our entire business case is based on real e-commerce, where things happen without any customer service interaction, without any hand-holding, uh, and, and, and proper transactions mm -hmm. without any other sort of interaction. And I think that <coughs> is kind of the final frontier of luxury watch sales and luxury sales in general on, on the Internet. Uh, and I think that that's when it gets really exciting, for sure. So what we really definitely understand, it, it, it's actually an ecosystem and everything is linked. <coughs> uh, how, how important is that for Cartier? How do you manage to deal with all these aspects? Uh, linking it is, uh, is fundamental. Uh, and, and just to come back on the, on the point that we were just making, I, I completely agree with Ben. This is uh, not something that has started with the, with the situation of the COVID, but it's something that has been accelerated. Right. We, uh, we've had... a. At Cartier, we've had the e-commerce sales uh, for, for many years. We've had uh, phone sales, which is not pure e-commerce, but uh, still, it's, uh, it's in, many, in many instances, we've been selling product that people never touched, uh, just, just simply because they had one-to-one -one interactions with us uh, using different channels than, uh, than brick and mortar. So, uh, but connecting all of this together is, uh, is, uh, is absolutely uh, essential because our clients, are moving again from one channels to another one right. and they expect to have this same personalized and individualized experience whatever channels they are they are they are visiting 
and uh, they can easily start in uh, uh, in visiting one of our stores, then going in, going online, then uh, then having uh, having interactions with one of our retailers uh, for the same product. And at one point, there would be a conversion. So what we are trying what we are trying to do is to make sure that uh, along this chain, there is never. There's never a, a break, right. so that uh, so that the client can can really feel that he's talking to one uh, one maison and, and one network. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to take a look now into the future because that's also what we'd like to know, all of us. But it's hard because we don't have a crystal ball. But um, we have a lot of uh, retailers watching us today for sure. Uh, what would you suggest to these retailers? And let's start with you um, at Cartier, Renaud Littré. Well, what we are suggesting is what we're doing with them, which is, uh, <laughs> which is uh, and we've, uh, at Cartier, we've had a, we've had a very, uh, a very straightforward approach, and, 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 and we came forward a few years ago by, by saying that we are supporting the watch distributions, we are supporting the watch multi-brand distributions, because we believe that's very much a part of the, uh, the watch industry as a whole, and, and it should remain a very strong network. Uh, but we are supporting them as long as they can also work with us to integrate this ecosystem that we are creating so that we can have this unified approach towards our clients that their, their retail value proposal remains very strong because that's, that's adamant to building any kind of retail business. So with all of these uh, criteria uh, combined, we are making sure that we are working together and that we are supporting each other. Hand in hand. Um, I would like to see if it's the same um, by age mother. Uh, how do you uh, react? What kind of initiatives are you pushing forward? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, it's similar at a different scale, definitely. But for us, the motto this year is don't sell more, sell better. And also work closer together. As uh, I think Ben said in the beginning, a lot of those small family moms and pops stores, they don't master digitalization. We, the brands, should be. And I think at Moser, we, we do master it. We have algorithms that have been working for years. They've learned. They know what our customers want, what they want to hear, how to engage. So what we're proposing to all our partners now is to kind of turn around the way a local marketing was being done. In the past, everything was handled by the stores. This, in our, our size of, of brands, they were handling the local budgets. They were trying to build a brand locally. Now we're, we're turning that around. We're taking care of that. We're saying, you listen, guys. We can target from here. We have algorithm. We manage a big database CRM from the headquarters, and together we're stronger. We can create amazing content that those people want to hear, and you will benefit from, from that because they will go in the stores, and then you will convert. So that's definitely for us this trying to make them change their perspective on, on marketing, on digitalization, and how we collaborate with the brand. It's actually a mindset change. Uh, do you also have this idea of things uh, at... Uh, Sorry, I'm looking at Hublot, sorry. sorry. Uh, yes, and I think one Im uh, important aspect is uh, talent acquisition in the sense that uh, when you talk to retailers, uh, there is, a, uh, I think, a scarcity of, uh, you know, the, the people you interact with sometimes. There is an understanding, but then there is a, a big vacuum in terms of, of or to who am I turning to uh, to actually uh, be able to interact uh, with yourself at, at the brand uh, level? Uh, so therefore, uh, there is there are people in the market, younger people, and I think you know we're still in a very traditional uh, distribution, uh, and there is uh, with different generations. So I think there is here a great opportunity to get into the watch industry through our retail network young talents that are ex ex extremely uh, digital savvy and, and that can bring to our uh, industry, uh, you know, because uh, the, the retail network is really where you have the most of the people that are representing uh, our brand somehow in terms of number. And this talent acquisition, we didn't need to help them and, and see the benefit, you know, of, uh, of, uh, of getting this type of profile. Uh, ben Kleimer, after hearing uh, what your colleagues just said, what do you think, which initiatives are the one you would push forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you from, from our business and, and my friend from, from Hublot, I think, j just nailed it. I mean, it, it, people, th there's nothing worse than, than buying a watch and then finding out from your more knowledgeable friend that you made a mistake. And our brand at Hodinki is knowledge, and that, that has always been our brand. So when Jack Forrester, who literally wrote a book on Cartier, 
says that the new cloche is wonderful, et cetera, et cetera, that means a lot more than just a, you know, a salesperson that doesn't know the difference between a centre and a cloche. Uh, and, and I think you know, that is what I would recommend for all retailers is finding people that have real knowledge. And I don't mean the ability to sell, which is a very different skill set than real understanding of knowledge. And the entire business of Hodinkee is based upon that. And so our editors, are not our, like they're not salespeople. That, that's not how they're trained. That's not what their job is. It's simply to inform people. And then, you know, if Jack Forster writes a great story on the new Cloche or on a new Grand Seiko or a Vacheron or Omega or anything, they say, oh, wow, I learned a lot about this from somebody that I really trust. So I'll purchase it from them. Uh, and so I think the investment in hyper knowledgeable uh, sales staff, I think, is, is really, really appropriate. And I, it, it makes me think of a a comment that a gentleman named Jim Seuss uh, made to me many years ago. He used to be the CEO of Tourneau, which is a, a big retailer here in the U.S. And he and this was seven years ago. And he said, you know, Hodinkee is the best thing and the worst thing that ever happened to, to Tourneau. It's the best thing because you got young guys and girls interested in watches for the first time. It's the worst thing because everybody that walks in that reads Hodinkee knows more than my salespeople. <laughs> and I think that's that's kind of a retailer's nightmare is when the, when the consumer comes in and knows more than the salesperson. And I think, you know, making sure that that doesn't happen is probably the retailer's most important task right now. So actually, it's just uh, experience sharing. That's really what, it, what matters, right? I think so. I think so. All right. Thank you very much for sharing with us. Uh, we'll turn now to you, Stefan, because you wrote so much. So we want to hear about what you're thinking uh, about maybe a summarize of all the things that we heard today. Uh, no, I think it's uh, we're clearly moving towards a model where uh, agility is at the core. OK, and agility, as we heard, is that we have to reconcile many competing demands, right? It's, it's about centralizing certain things, which is what uh, Edward said, you know, we're helping to centralize on a global level, but it's also a lot about centralization, uh, decentralization at the same time. Think about how Sephora, who is for me the leader, and perhaps with Hodinkee in the horology, in orchestrating community. You just can't create trust and communities without decentralization. And all these fans, all these passionate people about cosmetics, they produce the content for you. So it's about accepting that, that you can do certain things centrally at the brand level, but your retailers at the local level with their communities will also be able to do things. Well, they're all acting together, okay. actually. And the second remark, and just I stop there, is that you can't do what uh, uh, Ben, Edward, uh, uh, Renaud, and, and Philippe said, without reinventing the employee journey, okay? okay? So that, we means are, that means that if you want to bring top talent in the retail, luxury retail industry, where in some sector, the drop in the competency of the talents compared to 20 years ago is catastrophic. Frankly, I will be frank here, right? So, you know, the young people have options. They want to work in cool environment. So for luxury, it's going to be about how do we move from this culture of perfection where there is no empowerment, no initiative, no risk taking to this culture of excellence, you know, where you will accept that your employees are empowered, can take risks. Sometimes they will make mistakes, but at the end of the day, you will be so much more agile. Well, that's a pretty, um, do you want to react to that? Because oh, it's strong, I, I, it's a strong yeah, statement. Yes, I, I agree. And I think what, but one of the, uh, the key elements in the, in the change, and so that's also the way we are, we are rethinking our boutique, is, is uh, that we need to start from the client intentions. Because the client intentions has to drive the experience. Mm -hmm. And that's why it has to be personalized. Once again, uh, people come into our stores with very different uh, experiences. Expectations, Expectation in yeah. terms of experience. Yeah. Some want, want it very fast. They want something. They've, bought, they've been online. They, they know what they want. They want something quick. They want, they want it quick and efficient. Mm -hmm. Others want the full experience. Right. And, uh, and being able to empower, as you said, empower the team to, to do that with the proper knowledge, which is uh, absolutely very important, is, uh, is, uh, is extremely important. And having the place that allows for this, uh, this kind of uh, versatility is also very important. Mm. So we cannot think everything in a mono monolithic way anymore. 
Thank you very much for sharing with this. this is actually the moment where we will get the questions that you sent in during this whole session, the comments as well. So I'm going to turn myself to Pascal, and I would like to have a state of affairs right now. <laughs> what uh, were the main topics that people reacted for? Well, actually, uh, first, um, I'm very happy to see that our panelists covered really a lot of questions that, we've, that were asked during the session. So, um, but uh, some uh, remarks that came in, uh, there was someone uh, reacting, saying that it's interesting to see uh, that after years of opening motor brand boutiques, we see that uh, more balanced approach, integrating local retailers, uh, is underway. That's, uh, that's something that came uh, a few times. Uh, I have a quote from uh, William. Uh, that says, uh, as a digital native, uh, buying uh, online without uh, trying and, uh, and, and seeing and feeling the, the product for me is totally uh, normal. And I can buy a 50K plus watch without any issues. Maybe it's so a generational it's generation, problem. Generation, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a kind of a question mark, but um, yeah, I think they definitely. Can that's we it. have a reaction maybe um, at Hublot? What do you think? Is that a, a generation thing? Uh, probably, yes, you know, we started also selling online last year in May. And uh, to be honest, we were effectively also surprised to see that, uh, you know, the price tag, I mean, some people were effectively buying products over 50,000 or, you know, an average price of 20,000, but still an important sum. So, uh, yes, I think it's, it's not only a matter of, uh, you know, of, uh, of age, because uh, if uh, you have a scarcity of products, you know, if your product is rare and you put it online, you will then create you know a certain demand and probably have people of all sort of age but uh, but for generic collection probably yes you know you're more likely to uh, to nail uh, young people and they have no problem with this because there is a brand trust behind that i think this element is also important it's obviously uh, the, 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 there is uh, such an element of trust with the brand that is being established with all that you are doing away i mean on the digital uh, platforms but uh, you know away as well uh, in terms of experience that is reinforcing and knowing that anyway it's it's it's, it's a good purchase so uh, the trust is important another point maybe pascal that uh, popped yes up. Uh, a few questions yes. about uh, digital you know the new uh, right. the new normal is digital so one question would be uh, is digital distribution going to fully take over uh, physical distribution in two years five years ten years or is it going to be actually a mix uh, of digital uh, approach. A share. Who would like to answer? Do you want to answer at Edge Mother? I can, but I think I would I would quote uh, Ben on that one. I think uh, for for the short term, <laughs> definitely. I think what uh, what Tesla is doing with this combination of uh, multi-channel, omni-channel uh, approach with experience in those showrooms, which are not about like uh, selling the thing, but really experiencing it, uh, combining it with all those online digital communities and everything is the, at least the, the, if we're looking at five years, 10 years, I think that's, that's the future. Ben Clymer, do you agree? Beyond that, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I would agree. I mean, I think the best way to think what's gonna happen in, in the watch world is what's happening in cars, what's happening elsewhere. And if, if you look at what, you know, I mean, let's take Nike, a global sneaker brand, the average sales price is say $80, something like that. But they're, they're almost a luxury brand, I would say, and that they're aspirational to a certain set. You know, their business has gone dramatically online and I think that will continue. And I think there will always be homes for places like the Cartier Mansion, historic homes, et cetera. But will second and third tier cities in the US, you know, the, the, the small towns in Ohio, the Minnesotas of the world, you know, m real cities, but smaller cities, do they need physical retail? Probably not. And the, the only reason I say that is, you know, the digital experience is becoming so good, you know, r returns are kind of the, like such an important part of, of e-commerce. And, you know, to, I'll be totally honest, and we look at the way that Nike handles their returns. If you buy a pair of, of running shoes and you don't like them, you send them back and, you know, within three days, you have your money back and that's it. There, you know, there's no restock fee. It's easy. There's a prepackaged label. Um, and I think if, if luxury e-commerce can adopt those same policies, I, I think eventually digital will replace a good chunk of physical. Ben, Again, I think ben the flagship experience will, will have a, a, I do. I do. Really? I think it'll, I think it will, might take a generation. Um, you know, I think as people such as, as the gentleman on this panel kind of come into senior positions in this industry, I, I do think it's possible. 
I would like to have you. Not not completely, but quite a, quite a ways. Yeah, not completely, <laughs> not completely uh, for sure. I think there will be. A, there is a, there, there's been a, s a significant rebalancing already this year. I mean, for us, our online sales this year compared to uh, to to a year ago have been basically basically multiplied by ten. So so it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite significant in rebalancing it. But I, I do believe that the uh, the future will uh, will be into uh, an integrated retail once again, where where both uh, both the, uh, the the borders or the borderline between online and offline will sort of disappear uh, to create a, a more seamless uh, environment where each channels each touch point will play a different role. I think uh, the physical uh, physical store are also very. Um, uh, very significant in creating lo long-term loyalties with clients. Uh, we talked a lot about experience. Online experience is definitely increasing and, and improving tremendously. Um, but there are still some, some part of the experience that uh, the physical experience that could not be replaced and will uh, hardly be replaced in a, in a, even with uh, great innovations coming forward. So, so I do believe that the, uh, the online and, and, and digital at large will play an even growing a role within uh, within our, our client journey and, exp and 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 employees journey, but uh, the the mix between the two will remain uh, probably in our in our case more in favor of uh, of the physical store. Um, Pascal, some more comments, some oh, more yes. questions. <laughs> oh yes, all right, <laughs> okay, let's go, let's them. go. <laughs> <laughs> some quite precise. Um, one is about CRM, as uh, Stefan uh, beforehand uh, rightly said, it's always been a topic and is even more important today. Uh, with the connected uh, retail and, and wholesale, would CRM details uh, be shared between uh, mm. the brands and the retailers? Is that something possible? <laughs> Another time, the same question. <laughs> Who would like to answer? I see you smiling, H. Mother. Do you think it's possible? Well, I think by law, it's, it's complicated. I think we are, there are, especially in Europe, very strict rules about that, and you have to be careful. I think uh, privacy is the utmost uh, responsibility of the, of the brand. I think, it's a, it's a, of course, CRM is, is a great tool, but it's a dangerous one, and we need to, to use it wisely. So. You ask me, like, do you want to share the database with uh, with the, your retailers? If I'm not allowed to, I won't. <laughs> and at Iblo, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's true that there are legal restrictions, but you know, uh, what we have at Iblo is we have the so-called Iblo T-Stack Club, we are the club of Iblo owners, and there, uh, there is no distinction between, you know, uh, uh, what is owned by a retailer or a, um, you know, a, a boutique, it's just, uh, uh, you know, Iblo owners. And therefore, uh, I think uh, there, th that sees that it is possible and it's beneficial for, for everybody. So uh, effectively, in terms of ownership and the fact that the people have to opt in a certain system is very important to keep those silos because uh, people do not want, you know, they have a, a trust again in the brand and that the, the data is being shared. But I think also at the local level, uh, it's important that the retailer understand that it's beneficial eventually for them uh, to gather uh, possibly at their level uh, client details because most of the time the difficulty that we're encountering and you know, uh, even in terms of warranty or things like that, that sometimes people so far were neglecting this aspect and, and think that it was more an asshole than an asset. And, uh, whereas I think today uh, they can recognize that uh, eventually uh, it will benefit to them. So again, it's a matter of changing the, the culture. Another question, uh, Pascal. Yes, it's a very direct question um, regarding Hodinkee, as he, uh, Hodinkee is able to really pick their assortments. Um, is this freedom going to be extended in the future to retail partners? Ben Clymer. Uh, well, I, I, I can't speak for, for what is an option for other retail partners, but I, I think, you know, we occupy a very odd strange place in, in the watch industry in that we are, you know, a leading media platform and, and we're, we are different than a, than a retailer in, in, in certain ways. We are an authorized retailer for over 30 brands at this point, but we, we occupy a different, a different role in that we also kind of inform for the, the entire industry. So I think, I think brands, if I can make the suggestion, but of course, this is not my role, you know, it would be interesting to, to realize that certain retailers have a certain kind of clientele that might be appealing uh, to, to a certain kind of consumer and not others. You know, I think what this lady or gentleman might be referring to is, you know, the mandate from larger brands, mostly larger brands that say, if you want 
I mean, I'll just say the Daytona, you know, well, let's say you're a Rolex dealer. If you want the Daytona and the Submariner, you have to take the Cellini and the, and the two-tone Oyster Perpetual or something like that. Um, and I think, you know, that, that, that makes sense if, if you're Rolex for sure. Um, but, you know, and I think there are other things. What, what we do at Hodinkee is find stuff that appeals to our audience and be very honest with our brand partners and say, hey, this is great for a certain kind of buyer, a certain kind of market, but our people won't won't buy it and they just it's it's just not not up the alley of of, of our consumer and that's okay and i'm not like hodinki is not representative of, of watch buyers at scale it's representative of a very particular type of buyer and i think acknowledging that at the brand level i think would really be helpful and allow retailers to succeed so that they don't have to take on all this stock that they know inevitably it won't sell you know if, if a retailer is telling the brand that we can't sell this thing then why why would a brand force them to take it Sure. Th that's kind of a great, great concern. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's not, not my place to, to answer that on behalf of the brands, for sure. Renaud Littré, I saw uh, you I'd nodding. Happy, yeah. I'd be happy to talk about it because we've, <laughs> taken, we've taken exactly the opposite stand. All right. So what we're doing now with our, our retailers is that we've, uh, we're mutualizing the stock okay. among all of ourselves and making it available to everyone. So basically, uh, there used to be a model uh, that was described of... Uh, of a certain first of limiting stock to uh, per channels and, and making some product available only to certain channel and not others uh, and also imposing a type of product that the channel must be carrying so what we're doing now is we're working we're working on personalized uh, offer again per per, uh, per point of sale depending on the clients and making the entire stock mutualized and available to everyone. So That's basically, the holy grail of Omnichannel, right? <laughs> basically, Adidas is doing that too, by the way, and, across and globally. And we've, we've started that, so that, that means we need to mutualize the stock uh, and, and the stock uh, ownership, but also the visibility and the availability of the stock. And this is something that I've, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've started. We've done that in five years ago in China. And uh, all our point of sales in China, our external point of sales in China, are operating under this model for five years. And we're now looking at doing the same thing around the world. Edouard Melon, I saw you nodding as well. Do you agree? Yes, uh, we do that. We, I mean, at a different scale, we do that the same in, in, in China. That's, uh, that's the way we handle uh, the I mean, high tax on importation that obviously uh, forces us to, uh, to do that even more. Uh, but that's also what we do on, uh, especially on the higher end. Um, you know, it's very expensive to develop uh, pieces over 500,000. Those are kind of things that we mutualize with all our network. Uh, but also going back to what uh, that was said before, I think uh, the, the previous model was very dangerous, and I think the result was what we saw in the secondary market with watches being killed in terms of secondary price, which is actually the real price of or the real value of those products. And I think brands are slowly realizing it that when you want to know really what is the value of the, of the watch, then go on the secondary market and you'll find out. And sometimes it's quite uh, not so satisfying for certain brands, I would say. Pascal, we have a, a, a very, very small amount of time to get maybe a, a last comment or last question. I think we have uh, we really covered most of, uh, of our questions today. That's right. why a very, uh, very rich uh, conversation. Was. Great question. Indeed, yeah. indeed. <laughs> well, uh, it's my time now to thank you, all of you, for being with us today. Um, Stefan, thank you for analyzing and giving us uh, a perspective on the whole topic. Uh, Renaud Littré, thank you for sharing as well uh, in the name of Cartier. And I would like also to thank Mr. Edouard Melon, Mr. Philip Tardivel, and Mr. Ben Clymer from New York for being with us so early for you in the United States. Thank you for sharing for sh thank you for sharing your perspectives and points of view i'm sure it will help and it will inspire other ones to go maybe in the same direction that's it for today that's uh, almost the end i have one more appointment to give you and it's going to be tomorrow at 12 15 for our next panel discussion where we'll be talking about client experience and we will see uh, what are the innovative and impactful approaches and which one will remain which one will change well, we'll talk about that tomorrow with new guests, but that's going to be at the same place. So be sure to tune in at 12.15. We will be there. Take uh, good care of yourself and spend a beautiful afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>